Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ron Brownstein, Senior Editor at The Atlantic. Uh, this afternoon, I'm joined by former Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. We're going to discuss one of the most important timely and timely topics I can think of, how to reform America's criminal justice system and what it will take to sustain public support for reform in a complex and challenging political environment. Before we get started, I wanna thank the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge for their support of our journalism today. And I also wanna remind our viewers that we want you to be part of the discussion. And you can do this by submitting your questions via the chat function. We'll incorporate them into the conversation over the next 40 minutes. And with that, uh, former Mayor Bottoms, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor and a pleasure to join you. Well. I don't have to tell you that you have been really at the center of the criminal justice and public safety debate from every possible angle uh, over, over your term as mayor. And we're gonna talk about it from all of those different dimensions. But I wanna start with taking you back to when you were elected mayor in 2017. And early in your term, you made criminal justice reform a focal point for your new administration. Early on, you signed an ordinance to eliminate cash bail for certain offenses. I think that may have been the very first ordinance you signed. Um, and you also introduced a proposal to close a city jail and repurpose the building to become a community wellness center. Um, um, let's talk about that. Why did you come out of the gate with such a focus on criminal justice reform at the start? Well, I, ideally, um, elected officials bring their life experiences to bear. And for me, it was very personal. My father was an entertainer, a very well-known entertainer in the 1960s named Major Lance. And the Beatles, yeah. he opened for the Beatles. Uh, Elton John got his professional start with my dad. So as my dad used to like to tell me, he was a really big deal. And uh, at some point, my dad's records didn't sell like they used to. Mm -hmm. And I later found out that my dad struggled with addiction. And I, um, when I was eight, my dad made a very poor decision. He decided to sell drugs to help ends meet. So my father went to prison when I was eight and this very pampered, extraordinary lifestyle that I had been privileged to be a part of for the first eight years of my life disappeared literally overnight. And I've said ballet lessons on weekends were traded for visits to prisons across the state of Georgia, going into large auditoriums and gymnasiums, visiting my dad and seeing hundreds of men who look like my dad and, and hundreds of children who look like me. So that's something that I've, I've, I've always carried in my heart. And when I was campaigning for mayor, there were at one point, I believe 18 candidates. And as the field began to narrow down, um, a gentleman by the name of Mowley Davis invited me to his home with his wife, Jana, to meet with some community leaders, many of them progressive community leaders to discuss cash bill bond. And what I said to Maoli at that time is, you know, I, I don't know what you mean, and, which was interesting because I'd been a judge. I, I had been um, an attorney. I knew what a bail bond meant, but this concept of cash bail bond being punitive um, was, it was not the way it had ever been phrased to me. So I said, I would love to learn more. And within five minutes of the conversation, I said, oh, I absolutely know what this is about because I'd experienced that as a child. Uh, the family member who got locked up because their taillight was out and then, then they were in the city jail for four weeks and then they lost their job and then they couldn't pay child support. and. And these stories that were very familiar to me, I had never heard it couched in these legal terms, quite frankly. Um, and so I made a commitment then that if, if I were elected, we would do something about it in the city of Atlanta. And that's what I was able to do. What impact did that have, do you think? Oh, it had a huge impact. So our, we had a, a Jail, eight floors, 12 story jail in the city of Atlanta. Um, people who had been charged with petty crimes that could spend up to six months in jail were no longer staying in jail. And these weren't violent criminals. These people weren't charged with felonies. These were petty crimes that if you had $200 in your pocket, you could walk right out the door. If you didn't, you stayed for up to six months. So 
It allowed us to reduce our jail population significantly. Um, and then at some point, I also ended our relationship with ICE, which reduced the population even more. Um, and by the time I left my term as mayor, we were averaging maybe 33 inmates a night in this facility. And again, I, I have to stress, we're not talking about people charged with murder and mm -hmm. rape and armed robbery. These are people charged with city ordinance violation. So gave us an opportunity to really think differently about what we would do with this facility and how we would offer programmatic resources to people who were finding themselves in this re revolving door in our city jail. The uh, Just so people have perspective, when, when you say it was an average of 33 a night by the end of your term, do you have any sense of how, how big a reduction that was from when you started? It was a significant reduction mm -hmm. and the jail population had been dwindling over time. So just by, by way of a historical context, the jail was built sometime around the time that Atlanta hosted the Olympics in 1996. Some people have said it was to sweep all of our problems off of the street. I, I don't know that to be true, but that's what mm -hmm. some people have thought. So we built this massive facility. Um, at one point we housed felony, people charged with felonies. They would get picked up in Atlanta, put in that jail, would have a first appearance hearing in our municipal court, and then they might be transferred over to the county jail. So it was fully occupied at one point. Um, after several years, we stopped processing first, uh, first appearance cases in Atlanta, felony. So that reduced the mm -hmm. population significantly. Mm -hmm. And if I had to guess, Ron, if my, my memory serves me correct, when I began my term, we were probably close to 1,200. Wow. May, it, and, and I hope I'm not wrong on that number, but it was significantly higher because we were also holding ICE detainees in our city jail. Talk a little bit about as well about the other uh, initiative that we that we mentioned, the One Atlanta initiative uh, to close down one of the uh, uh, detention centers and repurpose it as a community space uh, to deal with economic development and economic inequality. Uh, tell me, you what 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 was the original vision behind this project? So it was very simple to have this physical place in downtown Atlanta. If anyone's familiar with Atlanta, um, our, our main thoroughfare is Peachtree Street. And it runs through downtown and this jail sits on Peachtree Street um, right at the edge of downtown. You can see it from uh, I-20 that runs right through the heart of downtown. So to have this massive physical facility that anyone, whether it's someone who was experiencing homelessness on our street or someone riding down the expressway could say, I can go in that building and I can get help was really what it was all about. And we are challenged as so many major cities are across the country with affordable housing. So my thought, um, when we first began the discussion, this could be a one-stop shop. If someone needed some housing, we could repurpose this facility to offer housing. If they needed GED, if they needed vocational training, if they needed daycare that went from um, 8 p.m. Uh, to 2 a.m. because we know many people in need of resources don't work traditional nine to five jobs, that this would be a place uh, that they could go into and get access to those resources. And am I correct that, you, that your successor is not, uh, is, not, is not committed to closing down the jail at this point? Are, are, they, are they moving in this direction? Well, I, I can't speak to what his commitment is, but uh, there is a, a overcrowding issue in the county jail. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue I have with that issue is this overcrowding issue has existed for 20 plus years. At some point, they were under a federal consent decree and our, our county and city governments are separate and apart. So the county wanted me to accept inmates into our jail to assist with their overflow problem. And my concern is that this is a decades old problem yeah. of our accepting inmates into the city jail for an issue that you've had more than two decades, including a federal consent decree to address. 
um, is really putting Band-Aid on this larger issue. So I believe that by moving forward with what we had envisioned um, and providing resources to help stop this cycle of recidivism, um, that if we were able to proceed along that path, that inevitably um, it would impact the number of, of prisoners and inmates um, mm -hmm. coming in and out of not just the city jail, but also the county facil facility as well. You, it's kind of, you know, progressing through the timeline of your of your term. Summer 2020, only a few weeks after the murder of George Floyd, uh, Rayshard Brooks, an unarmed black man, was shot and killed by the police uh, in Atlanta. Uh, that put the focus squarely on your city. Uh, you fired Officer Rolf, who was involved in the shooting. You also accepted the resignation of the uh, police department chief, and you were met with public praise for your swift action. Uh, but then 170 police officers called out sick in protest. What lessons did you take from this episode about how to uh, ensure accountability among police officers? Yeah, there, there were so many. So uh, again, um, just a, a bit of history. When yeah. I came in, um, it was no secret that our officers were underpaid. They were some of the lowest paid in the entire metropolitan Atlanta area. And we were losing officers. We would recruit officers, train them, and they would go to other jurisdictions to make more money. And many of our officers couldn't even afford to live in the city of Atlanta. So I instituted the highest pay increase for our police officers in the, in the history of our city. And I, I really believed um, that I had established more mutual goodwill um, because the reality is I didn't want officers working for the city of Atlanta who didn't want to be there, who were resentful about being there um, and, and who couldn't even afford to live in our city. So fast forward to the summer of 2020, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my assumption was that that goodwill was a lot stronger then it actually was um, that the, the mutual trust was a lot stronger. Um, and the irony of the blue flu at that time is the week before I had fired a set of African-American officers uh, who were on tape uh, tasing some uh, a Spelman College student, a Morehouse College student. Mm -hmm. and, and the outrage was very minimal. Uh -huh. um, and after the Rayshard Brooks shooting, um, and it was a white police officer, that is, you know, literally when all hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were some other politics at play. Um, the union um, had a, a Senate candidate, a, a, a right wing Senate candidate at one of the press conferences. So there were, you know, 2020 was complicated. Yes. For many reasons. Yes. And, well, um, you know, but I'm, I'm happy to say that by the time I, I left as mayor, I really believe that those relationships um, were, were on the men, if not mended. And I understood the frustration. It had been a tough summer for police, public safety all across America. Uh, they were getting, you know, they were getting a, a lot of flack in a lot of ways. So I understood it, um, but I also had to make the decision that I thought was the right decision for the city of Atlanta, given what we were facing in the summer of 2020. And that decision um, was to terminate those officers. I want to get to that broader question about the summer of 2020, but but to follow up on what you were saying that you, you know you thought the goodwill was stronger than it actually turned out to be at the moment. I'm wondering what lesson you take from that is is the key to ensuring accountability among police working with police unions and, and, and individuals, or is it building public demand and support and calling out the issue in public? Is it an inside strategy or an outside strategy that, that is more effective to establish accountability? I think it has to be both. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in Atlanta, you know, our, our police union is not as strong as it is in some cities, say New York or in, in Chicago. And in fact, we don't have a, a formalized agreement with our police union. It really is, is a, a, a courtesy 
um, in engagement with our police wow. union. Okay. Um, and so there, there are some who will say that, and, and at some point there had been two different unions. So there are some who would say the union didn't speak for the rank and file. The other, there were others who said they absolutely spoke for the rank and file. So part of the challenge, inherent challenge is who, who's speaking for whom. Um, but the bigger lesson um, what, was that there, there had to be direct engagement with our rank and file officers, that mm -hmm. it was necessary to listen, to understand their frustration, their pain, their resentment, their fears, their concerns, uh, but also to have them listen about what the community was feeling, mm -hmm. the frustration, the pain, the resentment, fears and concerns. Um, so there were a lot of lessons just about communication in general. And it was part of the reason um, that we really embarked on this deep dive into how we could improve those relations and how we could reestablish this community trust growing up you know, Officer Friendly came into the elementary school, he gave out badges, and there was the, this trust and respect for admi and admiration for policing in our communities. And to, to try and get back to that place, mm -hmm. um, that work will, it will be necessary to continue that work. But there were so many leadership lessons, so many personal and professional lessons that I, I took away from the summer of 2020. Um, let's talk about that summer, because I think that's when most Americans were you know, introduced to you, and particularly the night when you held the press conference uh, urging protesters to go home. You were passionate, you were personal, but you were also controlled and firm, empathetic. Um, what now, with, with a little distance, what impact do you feel that the upsurge of public protests in the summer of 2020, which is probably the most Americans who are on the streets since Kent State in 1970 at the same time, um, what, what do you think the impact of that protest was on the broader arc of how the American criminal justice system works and, and, the, and, and, and the cause of reform? I think across the country for the first time, so many people, especially African-Americans felt heard. Mm -hmm. that we um, had this moment that in our streets, once the violence settled down, um, that it was very clear from the outpouring in our streets that there were people who were hurting and felt that they had not been heard. And also that this issue was not going to go away. This was not going, as, as Audre Lorde says, revolution is not a one-time event. This is not going to be one day, one hour, one, one traffic jam of a protest. This was a sustained movement. And for elected officials across the country, it was a wake up call. Um, for me personally, we had just embarked upon looking at our use of force and had heeded the call from President Obama to take a look at the 21st century policing policies, a fresh look, and we had convened this council. And, and what the wake up call for me was, we didn't have the benefit of time. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to wait and we didn't have the luxury of waiting. We had to act and, and act immediately um, with real actions. And I think that is the most lasting impact of 2020, that there is still an ability to mobilize and effectuate change in this country. It, the tragedy um, is that it was on the heels of the death of, of George Floyd and, and so many others, but it was this reminder that change can and will happen in this country. And it's not gonna always be on the timeline or the calendar that elected officials uh, would, would like for it to be. Um, let's talk about that, uh, because certainly change is facing more headwinds, I think, uh, today than, than a couple years earlier. I mean, in the summer of 2020, the conversation in Atlanta, as in most cities, was centered on reforming, reimagining the criminal justice system. By the spring of 21, when you were considering whether to seek a second term, and certainly by the fall in the election to succeed you, uh, Atlanta, like most cities, was having a different conversation in which the focus had tilted more toward controlling 
crime. Um, in your mind, why did the focus shift? Was it underlying events? Was it political backlash? Um, what, what was the tilt there, the turning point, the pivot? People were responding. And in many ways, it was a knee jerk response. And it was, it was very uh, disheartening to see it happen. The beginning of my term, there was this enormous amount of support all across, across Atlanta and across the country for meaningful criminal justice reform. And by the time we got to uh, last year, 21, when Atlanta and other cities were seeing this uptick in crime, which I, I called it the COVID crime wave, mm -hmm. because it was a direct result of the depression, the anxiety, the uncertainty, the destabilization of COVID, plus the guy who was in the White House. And um, we saw it playing out very early in Atlanta and in Georgia because we never shut down completely. While other yeah. cities were shut down, we were open. So we saw it happening very quickly and before a lot of other cities did. So it, it was disheartening because we know that the two aren't mutually exclusive. You can have meaningful criminal justice reform and still prioritize public safety. Uh, the two can and should coexist but when you have people go, oh, it's all about criminal justice reform, we gotta swing the other way. And then Atlanta, some of the talking points, and she's closing the jail, by the way. Mm -hmm. And it was frustrating because many of the people who would say this were, were well informed. They knew that our, our jail didn't hold fel uh, people charged with felonies or violent crimes and hadn't done so in almost 15 years. So one didn't have anything to do with the other, um, but you know, it's difficult to relay that to the public when, when people are, are getting robbed at the gas station and, and they're seeing the salacious headlines. Talk a little bit about what you, what you said there along the way that you, you do not consider reform and safety to be incompatible. Perhaps even they are synergistic. What, what, what is the relationship in your mind between reform and safety? Certainly the critics say, you know, progressive prosecutors pursuing um, different policies on criminal justice uh, are opening the doors to violent crime. Why is that wrong in your mind? It, 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 I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that you can have reasonable and sound policies and you can also look at criminal justice reform and you can say, we need to train our officers differently. We have tools that we didn't have 20 years ago. We have a technology that we didn't have 20 years ago. Our officers should not be trained to shoot to kill under every circumstance. Mm -hmm. There needs to be an understanding of what de-escalation means. And, and in the Rayshard Brooks case, it was a, a prime example of that the, the young father who was killed at Wendy's, you take a taser, our officers are trained to shoot to kill uh, because the taser is considered a deadly weapon. So we understand that's maybe what the training says, but is that really the best outcome? Mm -hmm. And is there something somewhere in between that could and should be done or should have been done to have a very different outcome? And that's what criminal justice reform is about. It's about looking at our policies. It's about not locking the person up who's experiencing a mental health crisis. It's about sending resources to, if, the, if a police officer is called, if 911 is called, allowing these officers to be trained in a way that they can do an assessment and say, you know what? This isn't someone who needs to be locked up in our jail. This is someone we need to refer to our pre-arrest diversion center so that they can get access to the resources that they need to get the assistance they need. So it's not taking up space in our jail. They aren't a threat. They need help. That's what criminal justice reform is about. You know, in you did you, in the exit interview you did with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which they uh, taped and helpfully put up on, on YouTube, 
You said that when crime is bad, it overshadows every single thing. So I'm wondering, in your mind, is a stable or even declining crime rate the prerequisite to sustaining public support for criminal justice reform? Can you move forward uh, and have a rational conversation about people who may not be a threat if people are feeling more threatened overall? It's very difficult to have a Mm -hmm. rational conversation when people don't feel safe. Because when people don't feel safe, our our instincts kick in and we believe that we have to protect ourselves from everything and everyone that can do us harm. And it's very easy and it's very simple to paint that as this person got locked up. They're the bad guy. If you let them out, they're going to come back and get you. And that's not the reality of it. But I do believe that if we do meaningful work, meaningful, sustained work, you're going to see those crime numbers begin to drop. Mm -hmm. And again, I go back to where we are with COVID. So much of this is about this uh, this mental health crisis uh, that's been bubbling beneath the surface. My good friend, Mayor Hancock in in Denver described it as our next emerging pandemic, Mm -hmm. that we are experiencing a mental health crisis in this country. Even those of us who didn't go in with diagnosed mental challenges, mental health challenges, have experienced them during COVID. And I think that's what you are seeing play out. So I think that we've got to put resources towards meaningful criminal justice reform. And we've got to make sure that we are getting a handle on crime. If someone shoots someone because they're mad at them uh, driving down the street, that person should be locked up and they shouldn't get out of jail. But if it's someone who is experiencing a true mental health challenge and they aren't violent, they aren't a threat to themselves and they aren't a threat to anyone else, there are resources available um, that we need to provide people. And I, I, I firmly believe that when we put our efforts in both areas, um, that you're going to see improvement in both areas. And, and that may, maybe that is going to be the answer to what, what I wanted to ask you next, because you know, certainly, as, as you know, that in many large cities uh, that have elected uh, prosecutors, DAs, uh, who came in with a mandate to kind of reassess uh, criminal justice policies that may be uh, inequitable, many of them are now on the defensive uh, as crime is increasing. Uh, uh, in some cases, in many cases in their jurisdictions, some are facing recall elections, others are facing friendly fire criticism from uh, even um, uh, uh, political leaders who are broadly sympathetic to the goal. What in your mind, from from your experience, and maybe what you were saying about doing both is is gonna be the answer, but what will it take for uh, the forces advocating for criminal justice reform to regain political momentum at this point? I think we, we've got to be reasonable in our expectations and it's not going to happen overnight. And we have to understand that. And I think the last presidential election showed us is people by and large or are more moderate than far left than far right. And again, um, in my term as mayor and my exit as mayor, I I was able to put a lot of energy into both. I gave our officers a 30% pay increase, but I also did a lot of work towards closing our jail and meaningful criminal justice reform. So um, by the time I left office, my approval ratings were still at 68%. So I I share that because you, you don't have to, you can walk in the middle, you can work with people on both sides um, and still get the work done. But again, we just have to, we, we've got to hear each other. And, I, and you may hear some noise in the background. Yeah. My kids just walked in the door from school. And, and so I apologize. If well, you no, no. Uh, you know, it, this could be our viral moment, you know, like uh, we, we, we've seen some of these. Um, so along those lines, I mean, your anti-violence advisory council in the end, in your final months, recommended hiring more police in Atlanta, right? I mean, you know, the conversation in, in 20. 20 was often, how do we redirect resources out of policing toward other community needs from economic development to mental health? 
in the end, they recommended hiring more police. And I believe your successor, Mayor Dickens, is going ahead with hiring more police. Um, now that you're out of office and, and uh, what, what do you, uh, and, and speaking, you know, with, with uh, utter candor, um, what, what do you make of, of, of that decision? Is that something that cities are going to have to do if crime rates are rising, uh, hire more police a couple of years after people were talking about shifting resources away from policing? Well, and again, Ron, I, I look at the way we did it in Atlanta. We did it differently. So we do need more police officers in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. We are a very large city. And until we don't have any crime, um, we're going to always need police officers in our city. But you can also do criminal justice reform, meaningful criminal justice reform, and make sure that these officers that you are hiring are the right officers, that your standards may need to change, that you may need to train differently. And if you are paying our, your officers a competitive pay, then you can choose from the best of the best, people who want to keep our community safe. And we, I go back to the 21st century policing yeah. uh, reform guidelines, we want, people who want to protect, not, we want guardians, not warriors um, in mm. our communities. And when I look at the hiring of officers, when I look at all of the other tools in our toolbox, it has to be in conjunction with retraining our officers, making mm. sure they have access also to the mental health services, making sure that they are trained and that we are holding them accountable. But I don't think that you have to say we can have one, not have the other. We should have one, not have the other. In Atlanta, again, because we reduced our jail population, we had a fully functioning correction staff. We were able to defer, divert funds from that corrections department to put back towards some of the work that we needed to do towards criminal justice reform. So I've never liked the slogan, deep on the police. Uh -huh. Every budget is different. Where you can pull money, how you reallocate money is different. We did it from our corrections department because we were no longer running a jail uh, a fully functioning jail that was costing our budget $30 million a year. We were able to reduce that significantly and put that money towards other efforts. Let me, let me try to get to a, a, a few other areas in the, in the, uh, in the, in the few minutes we have, we have left. There are a lot, there have been a lot of commentators uh, who have elevated Eric Adams, the new mayor of New York City, uh, where who president Biden is visiting today as a symbol arguing that his success shows that it's not only conservative white communities, but also working class African-American and Latino communities that support a more forceful approach to controlling a uh, crime and that the protest didn't really speak for the mass uh, of, 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 of families and voters in those communities. I'm wondering what you make of that. What do you think African-American communities, Latino communities, which often bear the biggest burden of crime, what do they want? from public policy and the balance between criminal justice reform uh, and, and safety? I think by and large, all of our communities want the same things. They want safe interactions. They want mm -hmm. their children and their grandchildren and their husbands and uncles and daughters and aunts to interact with a police officer and make it home safely in the same way our police officers want to have safe interactions and make it home to their families safely. Um, I, I would say, Frequently, uh, especially over the holidays, if I went to my closest police precinct, there would probably be at least 10 to 20 of my senior citizens there with honey baked hams and smoked turkeys providing mm. meals for our police officers because they recognize um, the role that they play in our communities. They would be there because the police officers in our communities have had positive interactions with these folks. The first time they've met them has not been when they've had to call the police. It's been at the local community meeting. It has been in, in, at, at the local community cookout. So there has been an establishment of trust. So African-Americans mm -hmm. want 
safe encounters. Police officers want safe encounters. White kids, Latina kids, everybody wants a safe encounter uh, with the police. And I also want to be able to call the police when something bad happens. When my nephew was murdered, it was the homicide detectives from the Atlanta Police Department that found the people who, who murdered my nephew in a case of mistaken mm -hmm. identity. So I know there, there's value, um, but also as the mother of four kids, a, a 19 year old who's out all times of the day and night as a college student, um, I, I want him to be safe if he offered, if he encounters a police officer, uh, but I also want him to be able to get a police offer, officer to come and assist him if he's in an area or, or if he has an encounter that's not safe. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, I, I mentioned before uh, that the political environment for reform has grown more complex, more challenging since the summer of 2020. One of the things that have happened since then is that we have seen multiple states controlled by Republican governors and legislatures passing law, increasing penalties for public protests. Several of those states have uh, passed laws immunizing drivers who run over protesters. Uh, there is a proposal that was introduced last year, I think is coming back this year in, in, in Georgia from State Senator uh, Randy Robertson to basically uh, move down this uh, direction uh, in Georgia. What do you make of these proposals to stiffen penalties for public protests that, that become uh, unruly or violent? Yeah, it, it, it's really silly. And, and it really takes away from the real conversation and, and the need to have some real dialogue, some meaningful dialogue on why people are in our streets protesting. Let's have a conversation about the open carry law in Georgia and how protesters can walk with AK-47s down the street um, and there's no penalty for that. That scares me more uh, than 100 college students protesting peacefully in the street. And so I, I think when we peel back and we look at why were people in the streets in the summer of 2020, it was because we were witnessing something that we had never witnessed as a country as a whole in my lifetime. Um, and it was a need for a conversation and for real reform. And so I hope that when you see policies and, and laws like that introduced wherever you are, it is this reminder why elections matter. Mm -hmm. It's not enough that we show up and we vote for the president. We gotta show up each and every time when that local when that state senator, when that local representative is on the ballot, because if not, we have people speaking for us and setting laws for us uh, that, that are completely asinine and not at all in touch with where we are and where we need to be as a country. Let, let me ask you one. I, I, know, I know our time is, 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 is running short, but let me ask you one, one question that, that, that covers two dimensions of how you build consensus here or, or how you are able to move forward. Um, you have faced a lot of resistance from the state government overriding decisions you have made on multiple fronts. And Georgia is one of the states where the governor has signed a law even limiting how much localities can change their own police budgets, right? They, they, they signed that uh, last year. Uh, I want to ask you, how can cities defend their autonomy against what is happening in states like Georgia and Florida and Texas and Arizona, where you have Republican controlled state governments that are um, limiting, trying to override and preempt what you can do. And then looking at it from the other dimension, I'm, I'm, as a final thought, perhaps, I'm very interested in your perspective on what it takes to get community buy-in for changes in the criminal justice system, both in terms of public safety and criminal justice reform, so that people feel that there's something being done with them rather than to them. So kind of looking both up, uh, up to the state, down to the neighborhoods, how do you move forward? Yeah, I, I think we're necessary. We've got to challenge um, these laws in court. Um, mm -hmm. We've not faced that in Atlanta, I had not faced it um, as, as I, ended my term as mayor. But again, when, you know, budget, when you're going through a budget process, whether it's at the state level or the local level, it is a very intensive pro process. So you're looking at every single thing. So I'll give an example. 
We have a nonprofit police foundation in Atlanta that provides a number of resources, a number of entities give to this police foundation and it helps offset some of the things we can't do as a city with our budget. Well, there may be an instance in this budget, in, in this budget that's this thick, uh, that there is something we were funding through the city we no longer need to fund. Mm -hmm. So how silly is it mm -hmm. that the state uh, who's not a part of the budget hearings, not a part of, part of this process, says, oh, absolutely not. You can't move that money. You can't touch that money. It, it, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's a very simple response to a very complex issue. Um, and and it, again, elections matter. Uh, we, we have these outcomes in our state because we have repeatedly allowed people who've drawn maps that have made it more and more difficult for us to have true representation of who we are as a state, balanced representation of who we are um, as, a, as a state. And I know there was a second part the to- The second that. question was, how do you engage the community looking the other direction uh, so, that, so that people, feel that uh, criminal justice reform and public safety is not something that is being done to them, but with them. So th that's a really difficult thing to do. We looked, um, just as I was leaving office, we did a, 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 a advisory council to take a, take a look at where we were with crime, et cetera. We sent out surveys. We, uh, did all sorts of things. And, and in a presentation shortly before I left office, I'm looking at the map of the city and in the Northern part of the city in the central part of the city, more educated, mm -hmm. higher incomes, et cetera. The surveys were, were coming in by, by the boatloads because people were online, et cetera. And I said, did you go knock on the door? Did, did, you, did you call this senior citizen? I said, because if you sent a survey to my mother electronically, she's probably not going to get it. But if you come and you put it in her mailbox or you leave it in her door, she might fill it out and send it back. So I think that we've got to make sure that we're speaking to our communities and inviting them to engage in a way that works best for them, not in this kind of one size fits all way. Because when I looked at the feedback, I thought this is great feedback from Midtown and from yeah. Buckhead, but I don't have any feedback from my community in this survey. And so and my advice to them is run it just like I would run a campaign for mayor. There are some people I'll send text messages to. There'll, there will be some people that I will put something in the mail to them. There's some people I will email to. There will some people... I'll need to say it to them um, on YouTube or Instagram. We've got to talk to our communities, invite our communities in, and also this reminder for our communities that it's for them too. Because so many people, especially in marginalized communities, it's very difficult for you to get to sitting in a session about police reform when you're trying to figure out how you're going to keep your lights on and how you're going to be, put food on your table. So we've got to help people to understand that it makes a difference in their community and, and if necessary, incentivize them to be a part of the process. Well, Mayor Bottoms, uh, I would be happy to go on till dinner and I think our audience would be happy <laughs> to listen to uh, your analysis uh, for another couple hours. But in deference to your schedule and the conference schedule, I think we're gonna leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and, and for answering our, our questions so candidly. Um, and thank you again to the MacArthur Foundation Safety and Justice Challenge for their support of our journalism today. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.